Crystal Young Otterstrom will provide an overview of her position with the Utah Cultural Alliance. Uh, she is the e Executive Director of Utah Cultural Alliance, the statewide advocacy, advocacy voice for the arts, humanities, and cultural businesses of Utah. Thank goodness we have someone like that here. I know states that do not have people like that. It's really hard to get the arts supported. State Treasurer of the Utah Democratic Party, an elected position, and one of the managing editors of mormonpress.com. Young Otterstrom serves as co-chair for LDS Dems of America and as co-founder and board chair for the Salty Cricket Composers Collective, which I hope you tell us what that is. <laughs> sure, that's the event I can't say <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a good name. For eight years, she was the audience development manager for the Utah Symphony and seven years for the Utah Opera. Unbelievable. Merged. Merged, good. Uh, a composer and coloratura soprano. Maybe we'll ask you to sing a little bit tonight. No, I'm just kidding. Gary Reed made me sing once and that's not. No. <laughs> uh, she is not a poli-sci undergraduate, but she's worked, she is right there in the middle of politics in the state of Utah. But her background is in music theory, a BA in music theory with minors in humanities, economics, and marketing. That covers a lot. And, I, and please give a welcome to Crystal Young Otterstrom. I'm happy to be here, and I, I'm excited to see one of my mentees over there. <laughs> I've really enjoyed being a mentor. Um, so I do have uh, prepared remarks, and I am actually thrilled that we're a little smaller because I, I like intimate spaces. I'm around crowds all living day, all day long. So, so I'm happy to tailor this a little bit to what you all are interested in, what you all are uh thinking about in your career path, but I, I plan on talking kind of about my career path and my political path, how I got there, lessons I learned along the way, because those are all things that I was hungry for as a child, as a, not as a child, but <laughs> as a student at BYU. Because um, as you can probably imagine, in the, in the School of Music, we didn't really talk about careers. <laughs> things have changed some uh, since 20 years ago, sadly, but uh, well, positively that has changed 20 years ago. That's the sad part. That's how long it's been for me. But um, do you have any driving questions first before I, I dive in? Is everyone poli-sci majors? Anyone studying? I see a, a no. What are you studying? Psychology? You're poli-sci? Any others in the room? Double majors, minors? Finance and a minor in music. What's your instrument? Voice. What's your voice type? Baritone, nice. Computer science, very useful. Double major or just cool. My husband's a programmer. Well, he studied computer science. I always say programmer. He likes computer science. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other majors interests represented in the rooms? Economics, that's my minor, I like that. Communications, excellent. My other major was marketing, minor I guess. Cool, all right, um, I'm, just, I'm just gonna dive in. Feel free to ask me a question at any time. Um, feel free to pause me, I like questions. I like to be challenged. I wouldn't be in politics if I didn't. <laughs> People who don't like to be challenged don't survive very long in politics. So um, being a lover of, of literature, I kept thinking, what should I start my, my topic was? And unfortunately, I, I couldn't get past the famous line. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> Who knows what that's from? Who's that out there? Quick pop quiz. Yeah, that's Dickens. Yeah, which book? Tale of Two Cities. Good job. I am living proof that humanities majors, arts majors, can have a job. And so I like to quiz people on their cultural <laughs> knowledge because it's important. Um, so first, who am I? Um, since I'm here at BYU, I like that I get to talk about religion a little bit. And so 
like all of you here, I'm a child of heavenly parents. I have goodly parents. And um, I wear many hats. The slide before was my parents. So um, as Dr. Clark mentioned a little bit before, um, I am the executive director of Utah Cultural Alliance, which is the advocacy voice for arts and humanities in the state of Utah. I'm basically the lobbyist for the cultural sector. I also employ a lobbyist, um, but I am the full-time attention to it. Um, I used to have a consulting business where I did a lot of campaign work in addition to my work with UCA. Um, as you can imagine, work in the nonprofit sector and, and also in the campaign seasonal world, uh, it, it can be a little all over the place. It can be seasonal and then have nothing in odd years. There's not a lot of campaigns in municipal years. And I really enjoyed it for a long time, but now I focus exclusively on Utah Cultural Alliance. Um, so this is our mission statement. We're the ambassador of arts, humanities, and cultural businesses. We empower this sector through statewide advocacy, professional development, and building cultural awareness. And I'll talk a little bit more about UCA in a minute. But this is really far. <laughs> uh, so this is my side business. The slide before was my children. They're amazing. I also have some dogs and some cats. But these are some of the boards I serve on. So I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. And this is what I serve on right now, which is too many. So my first advice for you is don't serve on too many boards. But at the same time, it's a great way to build a network. And it's a great way to build fundraising contacts. Almost all the rich people I know who I can call and ask for money for a campaign or for my own organization or one of these organizations that I serve on, I have met through one of these hats. So I'm the current treasurer of the Utah Democratic Party, and as such, it's my job to make sure nobody embezzles the money, but I've also taken on the bulk of the fundraising work for the party. Um, I'm part of a new organization called Utah Women in Politics PAC, and um, I'm very excited about it. Check it out, utahwomeninpolitics.org, um, but they're a group of women that I went with, um, they're, they're, they're mostly retired, wealthy women, and then me, <laughs> and a couple other young people. And I went with them to the march in DC last year. Um, we, f we flew out from Philadelphia, we filled two buses of, of women. And when we came back, we decided we wanted to stay involved. I was really the only one involved in politics. Um, everyone else was pretty new. And so what the PAC decided um, after a few months of, of conversations was what we were really good at was raising money in our networks. And so we realized we can make a lot of difference um, in by raising, you know, We've, so far, we've raised $82,000. Our goal is $100,000 to benefit a handful of state legislative races. We're only focusing on state legislative races our first year. And we are interested in the handful of seats that are able to be flipped from Republican to de Democrat, because what we're interested in is moving the needle. Large ones party system is not good for anybody. Um, but we're also interested in, in backing moderate Republicans against less moderate Republicans in their primary and convention battles. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm the Emeritus Chair of LDS STEMS, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I sit on the Advisory Council for the State Arts Action Network at Americans for the Arts, which is um, an, a, a professional association of organizations like Utah Cultural Alliance, so other advocacy organizations. Um, BYU Political Affairs Society, I hope that's self-explanatory, but I, I really enjoy being um, involved in my alumni association and working with my compatriots there. And I'm, I'm the political diversity in the Salt Lake chapter <laughs> leadership, so that's mostly why I'm there. Um, everyone else is far more important than I am, but I greatly enjoy it. Um, I am on the board of Planned Parenthood of Utah. Um, I'm on the board of NowPlayingUtah.com. You should check it out. It's uh, an events calendar statewide. You can find all the cool things happening in the state of Utah. Um, I sit on my school community council for my daughter's elementary. Um, if you're familiar with how education funding works in the state, the large chunk of it comes from 
uh, income tax, but another large chunk comes from our school lands trust. So all these public lands that the state of Utah uh, makes money selling the, mi the mineral rights to, things like that, it, all that money goes into a trust that uh, the school community councils then decide how that money is spent school by school. So we're kind of like a governing board for the school. Um, Salty Cricket Composers Collective is now celebrating its 10th anniversary, and, and I actually have to run to that 10th anniversary birthday party <laughs> right after <laughs> my lecture. Um, but uh, I co-founded it 10 years ago um, to be a forum for Utah composers to play their music. So, you know, as uh, Dr. Clark mentioned, my background is in composition, but it pays so much money. <laughs> so it's not what I do for a living. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, so we, we mostly just did concerts and we mostly just kind of did our thing for a long time, but we added an LC Stemma uh, music program three years ago, which is a uh, free after-school program for low-income children. And uh, we do it at a Title I school in, in Jackson uh, Elementary, which you may have just recently seen in the news because they renamed themselves from being Andrew Jackson to Mary Jackson. Um, and uh, so ever since we've added that program, that organization has now grown a ton and we have multiple staff and I love it. So um, I'm on the board for Alliance for a Better Utah, which has been around since 2010. It was founded by Josh Cantor and it's, it's meant to be um, uh, an organization that is all about accountability and transparency in politics. So they speak out a lot on ethics issues and things like that. Um, and then uh, Utopia Early Music is an early music organization and Musinia is a new thing, but it's uh, meant to be kind of a professional development thing for musicians. I wonder if I can like, can I advance from this little screen here? Mr. Tech Helper. What happens if I touch it? Nothing happens. Okay. Um, sure. I do. Um, most nonprofit boards don't have compensation. Most of them, you have to give them money. <laughs> and that is true with a lot of the boards I serve on. Um, for most of them, it's, it's love. Uh, but like I said, they have been great ways to build my network over time to uh, teach me. Um, I've found many wonderful mentors and supporters through that. Um, the key to being a successful lobbyist is really relationship building with legislators. And so a number of these organizations are organizations we work on together. Um, so it all kind of comes down to that. And part of it is also just my, my inner drive to better Utah in the way that I think it should be bettered. <laughs> um, but often, uh, I get asked all too often, how, how do you do it all? And I hate getting asked that question, actually. But um, my life motto used to be the top. You know, what you can do or dream you can begin at. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it, which most people attribute to Geta, but it is not by Geta. <laughs> it is by John Astor, who was translating Geta and did it a little freely. <laughs> um, I was a little bummed when I found out it wasn't really Geta, but... Um, now the driving uh, motto of my life is Ecclesiastes 3.1, which um, it was senior ladies in my ward who kept saying, you know, when I would complain about all the things I had going on, they'd say, to everything there is a time, Crystal. And it sunk in. And now, so, you know, I don't do all of those boards every single day and my work every single day. They ebb and they flow. They go. Some of those boards meet twice a year and I have very little work in between. Some of them are very, very hands-on. Um, growing Salty Cricket from nothing to now being a six-figure organization took a lot of hard work, but thankfully now I have staff who do all that, <laughs> so I don't have to do anything. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my career path and my political evolution first uh, before I talk about my industry. I actually give this talk quite a lot to arts majors. Um, so this is kind of my first time doing it with uh, poli-sci. Well, I guess I've done it at the U too for Hinckley, but 
this is my first time doing it at BYU, but um, my parents exposed me to arts and humanities from a very young age. As you can tell, I'm obsessed with that. Uh, my dad is a banker, my mom's an artist, photographer, and genealogist. They're both accomplished musicians. Um, my number one life motto is, is you do you. You know, you gotta, you gotta do what's right for you in your life. And my me includes wearing all those hats and being a bit of a renaissance woman. It would be nice to focus a little bit more sometimes, but I do kind of see it all as, as one whole. Um, but well, music has always been that number one thing for me. I've always been incredibly passionate about humanities, especially history and philosophy, including politics, um, economics, investing, marketing, and debate. My parents taught me to be civically engaged, and a little known fact, and, and I don't tell my friends on the left this very often, but <laughs> um, I used to compete nationally in high school for the Fed Challenge competition in, in economics, and so um, I may be a Democrat, but I am a fiscal conservative, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> Um, I actually chose BYU uh, because I could study music and economics jointly. Um, and uh, I do often like to say, as I said before, I'm, I'm living proof that you can get a job and while studying one of those things. And one of the things that we like to tell people when we talk about Utah Cultural Alliance is that creativity is actually the number one thing in study after study after study that employers look for in their employees. So don't just have the skills that you need to be successful in your job. Think about how you are developing your own creativity, how you're developing your own self to be unique, because that's what they care about the most. Um, I started out as a voice major at BYU, and uh, my freshman year, I realized I don't like acting. And um, I'm pretty good at it, but I just don't like it, and, and that's, that's what the career is. And around that same time, I realized I'm really good at music theory, and um, I, uh, one of my professors said, you know, you can major in music theory, and so I did, and I was the only major. <laughs> and yes, I did have some classes one-on-one -on -one with professors, um, but I also had some with composition majors. Uh, my humanities minor is actually really kind of a double major, but I found out my penultimate semester that I was missing an advanced Italian grammar class that was required to receive the major, and I said, screw that. <laughs> so it's a minor. I never thought I'd use it, but now here I am working for an organization that advocates for humanities and for art, so lo and behold, it was useful. Um, uh, I... All through my career, people always say, how did you go from music to working in politics and running an organization? And I was always really torn between, did I want to be an arts creator or did I want to um, be more involved in the hands-on of what makes uh, arts and humanities function, how they raise money, how they give jobs, how they survive. Nobody could really give me that information when I was an undergrad at BYU. Um, because most of my professors really only knew academics, but I did find um, a mentor, Ken Crossley, who's still here. He's the arts presenter at BYU, so he's the one who brings in guest artists like Renee Fleming, Joshua Bell, big names like that. He's actually now serves on my board at the Utah Cultural Alliance, and the career advice he gave me, because I was really torn between did I want to continue to study composition in my master's degree, or did I want to get a degree in arts administration or nonprofit administration or an MPA? And uh, uh, those programs, especially arts administration programs, were pretty new 20 years ago. There weren't many options. And so his career advice to me was if I was really serious about becoming a composition professor, um, I should get the degree in, in music, the advanced degree in music. But if I was interested in arts administration, then um, I could do an internship. I needed to have the practical skills that I needed to do that work, which is why I ended up adding some of the other minors, graduated with 209 hours from BYU, um, although while in, in college at the Aaron Copeland School of Music, which I think I have right here. That's the Aaron Copeland School of Music in New York. Um, it's actually in Queens. You would never know it's Queens. It looks like it's in the middle of nature, but it's really in the heart of Queens. <laughs> um, uh, 
I did decide I wanted to focus by the time I graduated um, from Queens, but I was really burnt out, and so I decided to try out um, my ideas in the world world and do that internship that Ken Crossley had suggested. So I actually chose the symphony and opera because even though I had sworn after I graduated from BYU that I was never coming back to Utah, <laughs> and that was the first time I lived in Utah. Um, I loved, as a singer and a composer, um, I live in both worlds, and uh, so I was supposed to just spend a year in each of the major departments, spend a quarter in each department, and I started in the marketing department, and um, they wouldn't let me go, and within three months I had a job there, and, and I've never looked back. I never went and got that PhD, um, but I did get to keep up my composition through through Salty Cricket and other things. Um, so I worked for USUO for about seven, eight years, and then um, I opened my consulting business. Um, Symphony Opera continued as one of my clients until uh, last year when I shut my consulting business down to focus fully on UCA. And for a long time, I really loved uh, the, the variety that that gave me. I loved working on disparate big projects time after time. I loved being able to work on different campaigns, choose the campaigns I was working on, choose the nonprofits I was working for, um, that kind of thing. But definitely towards the end of when I shut my business down, it, it, it gets exhausting because when you're, you're when you're a consultant, and this is my advice for you if you ever go down the consultant path, is, is um, a, you never know where that consultant business is gonna take you. I started out just doing marketing and branding, and then along the way, event production happened, and, and then my event production business exploded because I was like the only event planner <laughs> in Salt Lake City who didn't do weddings. So I was doing fundraisers and big events and corporate events. Um, so you never know where it's gonna take you, uh, but you also, you never, you never really take breaks. You never really take vacation. Sure, you're in charge of your own schedule, and that sounds amazing, and you think you can work from home and wear pajamas, but it never really happens because you're always out there <laughs> meeting with people and growing your business and all that kind of stuff. But I learned a lot because the one advice I do give people when I talk about consulting businesses or starting your own nonprofit or something like that, it is a great way to jump, take a jump in your career to maybe go from a, a, a beginning entry level or, or mid-manager level to, to really jump ahead in your career and get to um, an executive position pretty fast. Um, so now I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about my political journey. So like uh, many Mormons, perhaps like many of you, uh, my parents are hardcore Republicans and I was a hardcore Republican and um, I even once wrote a paper in high school arguing that all Democrats should be shipped to Antarctica <laughs> because they were responsible for segregation and that was racist. Um, that's the kind of human being I am, so embarrassing. Um, so how did I get to where I am today being part of executive committee leadership for the state Democratic Party and I mean, involved on a lot of national political things as well. And actually, three words, Brigham Young University. <laughs> uh, my, uh, BYU helped me realize that the, the political values that my parents taught me um, weren't actually conservative values, they were liberal values. My parents cared a lot about uh, being a good steward of the earth, the value of public education. They taught me my love for arts and humanities and that they should be publicly funded. <laughs> they taught me to be no respecter for persons and to fight for equality for all. And um, they're even really big on compassionate immigration reform. Probably many of these are values that you guys share as well. And I thought that all of these values were Republican values and I began my college career at BYU as a member of College Republicans, an active member. I even canvassed for Bob Bennett. Uh, I remember wearing this huge t-shirt with giant ears in Spanish Fork <laughs> um, in 1998. Uh, but uh, it, it took a couple of those college Republican meetings for me to realize I agreed with nothing that they were saying. <laughs> in fact, the only thing we had in common was our shared testimony of the Book of Mormon. And um, for me, that actually was a bombshell because my parents so demonized um, Democratness and the left and the Clintons and all that kind of stuff. So. 
Um, you know, some of us in our journeys through life have faith crises. I had a full-on political crisis that was like an identity crisis. And, um, but thankfully, what got me through that was, was being in a safe place like BYU. I really felt free to um, explore my political identity. Um, surprisingly, many of my music professors at BYU are left or lean left. Um, and so that uh, helped me to see that it, I could be a good Mormon and I could be a Democrat. But um, I actually was really terrified to call myself a Democrat for a really long time. So I identified as a communist <laughs> first because somehow that was less terrifying. Um, but uh, I eventually became okay with it. Um, and it wasn't until I came back from graduate school that I started using that, that Democrat identity. And so a lot of people thought that New York City made me left. And I kept saying, don't you remember when I was a communist in college? That I'm less left now. <laughs> but <laughs> you never know. Um, I started out my political involvement in activism. So I, uh, back in the day, Mayor Rocky Anderson and myself, we planned all these big anti-war protests. And this was also the beginning of my career at Utah Symphony, Utah Opera. And I was very lucky that I had accommodating bosses who were fine with my expressing my First Amendment rights as long as I never used my symphony and opera title while I was doing it. And um, I, I did enjoy those years, and they were big and fun. But eventually, my being the pragmatic realist that I am, I, I realized I wasn't impacting policy. You know, if activism is the way you want to go, great. If you feel like it's accomplishing things, great. And in, activism is doing a lot right now. But for me, I needed something different. And so that's when I started getting involved in, in partisan politics. Um, I uh, first got involved um, on a marketing committee for the party, and then I became the vice chair of the Progressive Caucus, and then I became communications director for Young Dems of Utah, and then all this time I was working for the Symphony and Opera, and then in 2011, um, Jim DeBacchus, who was actually the chair at the time of the Democratic Party and is a BYU alumni, actually, um, he asked several of us to form LDS Stems, and some people think that's kind of ironic since he's this super out there gay left guy, which is kind of this persona he's taken on since being in the Senate, but um, we exist because of him. And so uh, Ben McAdams was the first chair. I was the vice chair. Uh, in 2012, uh, Ben McAdams decided to run for mayor, and he won. So he had to step down from being chair, although he's always been involved with LDS Stems all the way. So I became the chair then, and I've been the chair until 2017 when I ran for state treasurer and won. And so I stepped down from being the chair then. Um, and uh, if you are wondering how in the world I can be a successful lobbyist for my sector and a partisan Democrat, I'm going to get to that, I promise. <laughs> but um, first, I do want to say um, my involvement in partisan politics has actually really taught me, hey, there's my brother and sister-in-law, <laughs> have uh, really taught me uh, how to really impact the political process, how to think electorally, because you're never a successful advocate for any special interest if you're not also thinking about the electoral piece. And too many advocacy organizations are so afraid of taking sides or being seen as taking sides that they're not getting engaged in determining who their representatives are. And you know, if you can impact getting the representatives that you want from the get-go, your job is done right then. So uh, a, a handful of my colleagues nationally in, in arts advocacy think electorally, but it definitely is a new subject area for all of us. And so um, I, I really relish those years of doing it, even though It often feels Sisyphean. Anyone know who this painter is? You knew it was Sisyphean. <laughs> Good job. Titian. This is Titian. <laughs> it does often feel like that, but we make progress. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to Utah Cultural Alliance. Awesome. Great. Um, so I already said a little bit about what we do. So. Uh, 
what we do to fortify this sec sector is we have three programming areas. One, of course, is advocacy on behalf of arts and cultural organizations. Two, we raise awareness of the impact of the cultural sector by continually measuring and disseminating economic data. So I, I really use economics as a way to justify investment in arts and humanities. And then three, provide professional um, accessible professional development programs to boost skills for those of us working in the cultural sector. Because as you can imagine, most of the time, we may not have degrees in business and management and things like that, so we need a little bit of help in our sector. Um, we're a membership-driven organization of more than 300 organizations repre representing some 79,000 people working in the sector. We're actually one of the top two fastest growing states in the country for cultural jobs. Um, it's us, and I think Wisconsin is number one. Um, we represent the entire cultural sector, so everything from nonprofit cultural organizations, say a performing arts organization, a history museum, humanities, archaeology, et cetera, but we also do preservation, history, individual artists, galleries, architecture, things that are for profit culture as well. Uh, we work on all levels of government. Um, from the municipal level where we actually get a lot done working with mayors and city councils all the way through to uh, the federal level and even the school board. We had a big fight last year with the school board because the state school board, you know, f it's only 15 people. They voted to make arts education um, optional for middle schoolers and we said that's not acceptable. So we uh, did many traditional advocacy um, activities. We did a petition that grew to about 7,000 signatures. We encouraged constituents to contact their school board. And you might be surprised to hear this, but nobody ever emails the school board about their opinions unless they're one of very two fringe groups. And so when they started getting emails from thousands of their constituents, um, it was a wake-up call for them to really realize that this is something that Utah voters care about and matters. And so we were able to call a special hearing. Um, lots of public entities have special rules for requesting a, a formal public hearing that has to be entered into their minutes, so we did that. And then we worked one-on-one -on -one with them because they're, they're standards and assessment committees. It's all open to the public. You can just show up and you can say, I like this word, I don't like this word, I like this comma here. I mean, it's, it's very organic and hands-on. And so we were able to work with them to, to broker a compromise between we needed arts education to remain uh, required, but we also wanted parents to be able to have some freedom. And so the compromise that you may have heard about since then um, allows a parent to opt their child out of a subject, but they have to replace it with a similar subject. So if they don't want to do music, they could replace it with dance or something like that. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the part of how can I do my job um, oh, I, meant to, I forgot to mention something. So we are actually a two-fold organization. So we are a traditional 501c3, that's Utah Cultural Alliance. Um, we recently added in 2016 a 501c4, Utah Cultural Advocacy Alliance. Do I need to explain the difference between a C3 and a C4? Yes? Okay. <laughs> so C3 is your traditional nonprofit. Donations are tax deductible. We don't pay taxes to the federal government. Nonprofits are allowed to lobby. They are allowed to take positions on legislation. Some nonprofits don't know they're allowed to do that, but they can. Um, there's just restrictions. You can't do more than 20% of your staff time or resources on advocacy work. A 501c4 does not pay taxes. It's tax exempt, but donations to a c4 by individuals are not tax exempt because c4s are allowed to be more involved in the political process. Um, businesses can still deduct donations to a c4 because it can be deducted as a as a business expense as a, as a sponsorship, but um, individuals cannot. So as a c4, we're allowed to endorse. Uh, we are allowed to grade candidates. So a C3 can put out a candidate survey, but they're not allowed to make any comments on how well or terrible candidates responded. They just put the information out there. A C4, I can grade their responses. I can grade their voting records. So we can say this candidate really does support arts and culture or this candidate really doesn't. And Utah does very, 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 very well. Um, last year, the legislature 
the vast majority of the legislature got A's or better from us. I mean, you can imagine most of our bills aren't that controversial, but occasionally we have a controversial one. Um, our most controversial bill this session was the Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon bill. You may have heard about that, um, replacing the statue of Philo T. Farnsworth in D.C. with one of Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon. And we actually just yesterday had the ceremonial signing um, with the governor yesterday right in front of her statue um, on the Capitol Square. And we worked really hard on that bill. And uh, it passed 21 to 7 in the Senate. And then and at first we thought it was just going to sell through the House after it mostly sold through the Senate. But then the Eagle Forum got involved. And uh, the Eagle Forum uh, decided that elevating a woman who worked even though she actually quit when she had children, <laughs> was an affront to motherhood. And so they organized their forces. And, it, and, uh, and so the day that it passed, February 14th, which was the same day, a hundred and so many years ago that Utah women were the first to vote um, in the entire country, um, we thought the bill, well, Better Days 2020, which is a group that I worked on with that bill, which uh, they're one of my members, and they're all about celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, which is coming up in 2020. And um, they, thought, uh, they, they thought they had 41 votes, which is the minimum. I knew they had at least 43. Um, I thought it was going to be 46. It was going to pass with 46. But uh, what ended up happening... Um, and there were a bunch of definite no's that we knew about for sure, uh, but uh, leadership all spoke to it and really just tore down the few people who were willing to <laughs> speak in favor. I mean, Francis Gibson was glorious. You should go see what he said. It was fantastic. Um, and uh, they all got their votes in really early, which is a great strategy. And so that when the few, you know, the, the 20 or so knows, um, saw that it was going to pass no matter what, they realized this was not a hill worth dying on. So it ended up being 67 to 3 <laughs> at the end of the day. So that was pretty exciting. And speaking of that first to vote, you can actually get a license plate this summer. Um, that says first to vote, a special edition license plate from Utah. So that was something else we worked on since history is something we care about. So um, uh, the, the reason why it actually works for me to still be involved in partisanship and leader of a nonprofit organization that is nonpartisan is because a few things. I think I skipped ahead a lot. That's okay. Um, uh, arts and humanities, first of all, it's not a partisan issue. Even if you have differences in philosophy to what level government should be involved in public funding, for the most part, it's, it's pretty easy to justify arts and humanities. And especially in this state, in Utah, which we're actually number one in the country for live arts participation. Um, and that's one of my facts that legislators love here. Um, uh, we know that it's important. We know that it's valued. We've, as we've grown as an organization and kind of showed our electoral and political might, they know that this is something that their voters care about and so that they know we can work together on it. Plus, um, politicos like me, um, we, don't, we don't take anything personal. <laughs> it's all just politics. So we are all friends. We all get along well. We hang out. Sometimes usually they win and I lose on election night and that's okay, <laughs> which also helps for their case. Um, but they like being able to work with someone from the other side on an issue that we can all agree on and that's easy. It uh, makes them look cool. It makes me look cool. So we get along with it. Plus I've also worked to diversify my board. I've have an amazing lobbyist and I've really worked because while I did start out super hardcore left in the beginning of my political career, I've really learned, for me anyways, I think the most effective um, elected officials are the ones who are bridge builders like Mayor Ben McAdams, like Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, two great friends of mine. and. They are people I really admire because they're the kinds of people who really get work done. And, and it was Congressman Jim Matheson who really taught me that, you know, he, he got stuff done. He got legislation done more than ideologues do. So even though I am um, politically left, I am 
I'm not an ideologue. Nobody has all the answers figured out. There's stuff we Democrats get way wrong. There's stuff Republicans get way wrong. So that's an important thing to work together. Um, so now I wanna talk about the importance of, of relationships. Um, relationships are vitally important to success in life, I think, but also success in politics. Um, because at the end of the day, if it's someone you know on a first name basis, you can text them and say, you know what, I would really like you to consider voting this way on this bill. Um, if you have developed a real, honest, warm relationship with them, they're gonna listen to you. Um, uh, I actually wanna tell a quick story about that. It's going back to that Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon Bill, um, I was in DC a few weeks ago for National Arts and Humanities Day, meeting with our federal delegation, which we've actually had kind of a hard time building honest to goodness relationships there, but uh, the last two years it's really improved. And, and so I was sitting down and having a warm conversation with, with Congresswoman Milov, and uh, she asked about, you know, what was the deal about Eagle Forum opposing that bill? Doesn't make any sense, so I explained to her why, and she's like, I take personal offense to that. <laughs> I'm a mother and I do a great job, and I'm like, you do. So, um, you know, when you have a relationship like that with an elected official, that's where you can really impact what you're doing. And so, even if someone may disagree with you a lot on a lot of issues, it's still worth building that relationship with them. Um, I play words with friends with a lot of the legislature. It's a good way to um, get to know each other outside of politics. Uh, um, a number of the boards I've been involved with are a good way to get involved with them. And so despite me being a leader in the Democratic Party, now we've got 100% of the state Senate belonging to our cultural caucus, uh, 68 of 75 members of the House, and we're gonna get to 100%, but we're almost there. We're like 94% of the way there. Um, and even though Utah Cultural Alliance maybe isn't a political force on the sense of you know the UEA, the NRA, or if you follow internal politics, the Buckshot Illuminati <laughs> caucus, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> um, we, are, we are respected now, we are taken seriously, and, and legislators asked to run our bills, they asked to sponsor our RFAs, our line items, our budget requests, and they wanna be seen as, as our ally. So, um, one of the things that I wanna communicate to you as I wrap up is um, my day-to-day -day life at Utah Cultural Alliance, in my board work, in my prior careers at the Symphony and Opera, with my consulting business, with running for campaigns. Um, these are my final words. Diversify your skill set. Just because you're majoring in something, we all say this, and I never believed it when people told me this, but what you major in is very unlikely to be what you're doing 20 years from now <laughs> or 30 years from now. Um, you're gonna take many different paths um, throughout your career. So you wanna diversify your skill set. You know, my being an executive director of a nonprofit, I have to jump from leading the communication strategy, the marketing strategy of my organization to fundraising for my organization. If I don't do the fundraising, I don't get paid. So when you run your own nonprofit or you run your own business, it's, it's fun fundamentally up to you. Um, I have to be a boss. I have to manage people. I have to do the budgeting. I have to do my accounting and I have to, um, well technically my treasurer submits my IRS reporting, but I still have to go <laughs> over it. <laughs> and uh, some of those things were things I studied in college. A lot of those things weren't. Some of those things were things that I got through you know, the grace of genetics or environment and good mentors, but a lot of it just was quick learning on the go. So you definitely wanna diversify your skill set all the time. You always wanna be constantly learning, constantly picking up new skills. Um, number two, build bridges. Um, and, but I wanna connect two and four really quickly because at the same time, I called it making the bacon, but um, when you're in politics, people respect you when you take a stance on things, when you stand for things, when you are known as being passionate on certain things. They don't like it when you're immovable. Um, the people who are immovable are the worst to work with, um, and we do have a few of those in the legislature, but for the most part, you know, if you're out there, if you're speaking up publicly, if you're writing op-eds, if you're talking to the press, um, 
but you're also known as being able to work with people. That's how you really get things done, by bringing in that combo of being a bridge builder, but also having a spine. You know, you don't want to be so much of a bridge builder that you don't stand for anything, you're not known for anything. And I think that's sadly where a lot of moderates get, you know, kind of poo-pooed on, but now we're in this age where there's no moderates. How deeply do we miss that <laughs> everywhere at all levels of government? Um, so don't be afraid to speak out and draw on the line on that because people respect that, especially in politics. You know, politicos, we all have strong opinions and we like to argue with each other, but, um, but we also respect when we can recognize that we're wrong. Um, I already talked about the, the importance of relationship building and networking, but um, don't be afraid to say yes to things. Never assume that you're not worthy of being on a board or serving on a board just because you're in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s and you're not the 60-year-old billionaire or whatever. Um, if they're inviting you, they want you for skills that you have to offer, so have confidence in yourself. Um, and last but not least, um, and this has been um, a hard one for me to mention. You know what, I changed my number five. I was going to talk about families. Okay, so there's going to be six things. The fifth thing is ignorance is bliss <laughs> because there are most definitely members of the legislature who have absolutely no idea that <laughs> I'm involved in Democratic Party politics. And, you know, if it comes up, I mention it. But uh, there are plenty who absolutely know it, and I've debated them publicly on television before. And, again, like I said, we're all friends. We all get along. Um, but the, the last thing I did want to talk to, and this is the last but not least, um, so this will be number six, is always make time for your family and your interpersonal relationships as you're going about your careers. Um, it's, especially when you go into politics, politics can become all-consuming. There's so many causes. There's so many things that are important. There's so many things pulling at your time. But it's important to really learn to put boxes around it. And, and I especially want to talk to the women in the room um, since we are LDS, and I actually really appreciated that one of the questions that uh, Dr. Clark put on um, the question, none of it was asking me, how do I balance motherhood and working? So I really appreciate that. But I think it's important to, to make sure that it's important to say that you can do both. <laughs> you need permission. Um, I can't tell you how often young women come up to me and say, Crystal, I'm really glad to get to know you. I'm glad to follow you on Facebook because never in my life have I known LDS women who did those things or said those things and it gave me the strength to be able to say and speak my truth to power. And so you never know who you're going to inspire by speaking up and standing out as President Nelson asked us all to do. Um, so um, I want to conclude with my, my, um, my core beliefs. And then I'll be happy to take a couple questions. But first of all, our capacities change all the time. I think I've said that a lot. Um, the message you hear now from your heavenly parents about what you're supposed to do in life, what the career path you're supposed to be following, you may hear a different message in 10 years, and that's okay. It's all part of the journey to change the directions that we go. Your capacities will change all the time. There's days where you can do it all. There's days where you can do nothing, and that's okay. <laughs> Give yourself permission. Um, and I think it's also important to work to expand our capacities. You know, we can do more than we think we're capable of. Um, you never want to run faster than you have strength, but um, you 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 can do it. And then finally, I want to I want to quote Elder Holland about this is one of my favorite quotes, and 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 this is the core of of my religious practice. And he says, "There is room for those who speak different languages, celebrate diverse cultures, and live in a host of locations. There is room for the single, the married." for large families and for the childless. There is room for those who once had questions regarding their faith and room for those who still do. There is room for those with differing sexual attractions. In short, there is a place for everyone who loves God, and that's the core of who I am. You've got a place with Heavenly Father, and you've always got a place with me. So, the end. <laughs>